Bonjour à tous. Um, I'm afraid I can't speak French, <laughs> um, so thank you very much for um, inviting me here to PyCon FR to talk about um, Matrix and for having me, and yeah, apologies for speaking English. Um, can everybody hear me? Can everybody understand me? Yeah, brilliant. So, magnifique. So, Matrix. I'm not going to talk about async I.O. I'm going to talk about Twisted, mainly because um, when we started Matrix two and a half years ago, uh, async I.O. didn't exist. Python 3.5 didn't exist. So uh, we're going slightly back in time to see what happens if you build quite a large project um, on top of Twisted and some of the challenges that we hit um, along the way. And I'm sure that um, people who know all about async I.O. will explain to me um, how better it would be if we were using that than Twisted. But to understand how Matrix uses Python, first of all, you must understand Matrix. So Matrix is a non-profit um, open standard for defragmenting communication. I mean, I'm sure we're all very familiar with the way in which online communication has ended up trapped in silos inside these walled gardens, and the typical users aren't using XMPP, they're not using Matrix, um, they're not using SIP, they're using WhatsApp and Facebook and all of the, you know, Gitter, Slack, all of these different silos, and Matrix basically exists to try to fix the fragmentation problem. This is our last chance, basically, to try to have interoperable open communication on the internet as we see it, and so that is what we're trying to do. From a techie perspective, from a geek perspective, you can think of us as an open, um, entirely decentralized, um, persistent, eventually um, consistent, cryptographically secure messaging database with a JSON over HTTP API. So sorry for all of the adjectives and buzzwords, but it's kind of true. It's basically a decentralized object database with an HTTP API. You put JSON onto a server, it's signed by the server, it's replicated to the other ones, and so it's kind of a bit like Git in terms of being a decentralized system, except rather than for source control, it operates on communication or JSON. And that could be instant messages, it could be VoIP, it could be IoT signaling. So why? Well, the aim in the end is to create this global communications um, meta network. We would call it an internetwork, but apparently internetwork already means something else. That bridges all of the existing silos together and really liberates our communication so that it's controlled by us. So rather than being forced to use WhatsApp, to talk to people on WhatsApp, you can pick which application you want to use. You can have an open API on it. You can talk to people on other ecosystems, whether that's the phone network or WhatsApp or Gitter or Slack or whatever, and it just works. At least that is the dream. So let's look at um, some of these silos. I mean, classic ones are Skype, the phone network itself, Hangouts, GitHub. There's so many of them. Matrix exists literally in the middle to go and try to glue them together. Hopefully that's visible. But basically you have a mesh network of servers, which are the blue, um, the dark blue dots, uh, which have native Matrix clients connected to them, which are the green dots. You then have the light blue dots, which are bridges through to other um, systems. So we have bridges to well, all, all of those uh, and a lot more. So the whole point of this is that no single party should ever own your communication. You should never have your information trapped inside WhatsApp, for instance. The whole idea is that each participant equally has control and ownership of that information, just like Git. So what can you use it for? Well, obviously group chat is a huge use case. And group chat is um, the primitive that we provide. We do not provide one-to-one -one chat because a one-to-one -one chat is group chat with two people. You, you can use it for WebRTC signaling. Anybody who has worked with SIP um, is probably familiar with some of the challenges of SIP. And we, before we did Matrix, spent 15 years building VoIP stacks and SIP stacks before we thought, hey, what would happen if we just used HTTP and if there was an open standard? And it turns out that having an open standard on HTTP is many, many worlds better than poor old SIP or H323 or any of those um, signaling protocols. 
Um, you can use it for bridging anything, as we just said. And one of the interesting things is Internet of Things data, because you know if the fragmentation is bad for messaging apps, it's terrible for IoT. Getting your Apple stuff to talk to your Fitbit, to your Garmin, you know, there is no interoperability there at all. So in, in the end, if you just needed a PubSub database, then obviously Matrix can be used for that too. So many people at this point typically will say, why are you inventing XMPP? This already exists. It's 15 years old. It's the best thing ever. You're terrible. You're diluting the world. And um, we get a lot of hate mail from some people in uh, the XMPP community. I would argue well, we really aren't. And that it's just a totally different um, philosophy. So our matrix, we provide one spec. There are no extensions, it is just one monolithic spec at a given version. There are modules within that, so that, you know, uh, for different feature profiles, if you have a um, command line interface, there's no point in, spe in using the bits for displaying images or doing VoIP. And if you've got an IoT device, there's no point in doing instant messaging because your fridge probably isn't going to be having an instant messaging conversation with you. But in the end, at the moment, I think we're on matrix spec version 0.2.1. And if you implement that, it will work. So there's no chance of fragmentation. There's one doc to read, and it has everything in it. Totally different primitives to XMPP. Um, we're talking entirely in terms of synchronizing conversation history. It's not passing a message from A to B. It's not even passing JSON from A to B. It's very much, I have this room with this timeline and the state of information, and I need to synchronize it across all the other servers participating. And also, end-to-end -end encryption is built in as a first-class primitive into the spec, so that everybody is speaking the same dialects of end-to-end. -end. I'm not going to talk much about end-to-end -end now, but it's really cool. It's, um, it's kind of inspired by what Signal does as what used to be called an axolotl ratchet, nowadays a double ratchet. And um, we finished implementing it about three weeks ago, and it's been audited by NCC Group over the last couple of weeks. And we just got the audit back, and I'm not allowed to talk about it yet because it hasn't been published. Um, but suffice it to say, we're quite happy with the results. Obviously, it's HTTP and JSON um, as the baseline API, but it's not just HTTP. Matrix is designed to go over whatever transport you like. So we have people putting it over WebSockets, over MQTT, over CoAP, over XMPP, if you so desired. Um, we just keep HTTP because it's the simplest baseline and everybody knows what it is and can speak it. And finally, uh, a big difference to XMPP is it's called matrix. It's about matrixing things together. It's defragmentation. It's not trying to be the 15th protocol, the, you know, the sort of special protocol that everybody's going to change over to. It's very pragmatic. It's uh, honestly, uh, it tries to be um, the glue, very lowest common denominator glue between everybody else. What does it look like? Well, kind of um, similar um, to the previous slide. In fact, it is a zoom at <laughs> the previous slide. You have the home servers in the middle, which contain all of your conversation um, history and your accounts. Um, then you have application servers around um, connected to those which bridge through to other things. You have clients which connect. And then the odd one out at the moment is identity servers. So identity is still a somewhat um, unsolved problem in Matrix. What the identity servers do is purely to map real-world identifiers to so-called matrix IDs. So the idea of matrix is not that everybody has a Jabber ID or a SIP URI. Instead, you identify people using the, creden uh, the identifiers they have today. So in my phone book, I've got a bunch of phone numbers, email addresses, Facebook IDs, whatever the hell. And I should be able to say, I want to talk to somebody based on their phone number. Please map that to their matrix ID. And so the ID servers purely do that mapping. At the moment, they're centralized logically. Physically, they're geo-distributed across different companies, a bit like DNS root servers. But something in the next year we're going to look at a lot is how to properly decentralize that using kind of possibly blockchain-style um, approaches like Blockstack or Namecoin or even the stuff that Keybase is doing, if you're familiar with that. Um, the matrix ecosystem itself. So what do you get? 
Right. The big thing is the spec itself, which is this document that um, obviously defines the main APIs that connect the servers at the bottom to the clients at the top. The blue stuff comes from us, comes from matrix.org, and we provide three stacks, um, the JavaScript stack for the web, iOS stack, and Android, obviously. And the stack comes in three levels, the SDK that wraps the HTTP API, and then the next level up is um, the user interface components, so chat views, VoIP views, video views, um, you know, room indexes, that sort of thing. And then on top of that, you have apps. Um, the blue ones are Web Console, which is a very thin wrapper on the default um, SDKs. And then the orange one with the R logo is Riot, which is the flagship app for Matrix, um, which is built to try to show off all of this. Then on the right-hand side, you have um, the community, and we've got a very active developer community now. It's more active than the core team, which is really cool. And you have loads of different clients written for command line, for desktop, for iOS, Android. Um, even somebody did a file system client day before yesterday, which is incredibly cool. It's 200 lines of Go, if I'm allowed to mention Go here. And it goes and talks matrix and synchronizes it with a file system on your local machine. So you can read the messages in rooms literally by tailing and catting that, that directory. And if you want to send a message, you just go and echo into a named pipe to send the message. It's a really, really cool hack. Um, on the bottom, you have Synapse, which is what we'll mainly be talking about today, which is the Python reference server. And then we have lots of bridges that we've written through to different protocols like Slack and Gitter, et cetera, IRC. And then finally, on the bottom right, uh, you have everyone else's servers and services. There are about seven different server implementations right now, um, of which one from the community has really picked up um, adoption, and it's called Rumor, and it's written in Rust, and it is the opposite, almost, of our Synapse implementation. So it's really fun to have the two different competing server implementations kind of racing against each other. Um, and obviously, there are lots of bridges there, too. By the way, if anybody has any questions at any point, please interrupt me. I'll obviously take them at the end, but if I say anything that doesn't make sense or I'm talking too fast or in the wrong language, then please just, um, uh, just yell at me. Um, so what do you get in Matrix? Obviously, you get decentralized conversation history. You get two data structures. You get a timeline, which is actually a tree of the causality of messages in a room. And you also get key value stores, which we call state. So things like the name of a room, who's in it, the topic, the color, that sort of metadata is state, and then the actual messages are the timeline. Obviously, it's group messaging. Already spoken about end-to-end -end encryption. We specify how the VoIP signaling for WebRTC works, and this is a huge thing because WebRTC has no standard signaling there. So if you're on HTTP on a web browser and you're using WebRTC, the first thing you think is, oh, how am I going to set up a call? I know, this is really simple. I'm going to invent yet another random bespoke HTTP signaling API, which everybody does, and it works possibly OK for them, and it can't ever talk to anybody else. So we're just trying to provide at least one standard HTTP signaling API uh, for WebRTC here. You get um, server-side push notification rules, which is really cool. So you can set up all of your notifications on the server, and they're magically synchronized over all of your clients. Um, you also get um, unread counts um, and badges, which are synchronized over all of your clients, which is pretty important. Full text search, server-side, read receipts, typing notifications, presence. Uh, synchronized read state. Uh, we give you a really crap content repository, which is just a um, uh, REST API to put arbitrary files, which then fans out to the other servers. We're looking at replacing that with IPFS. And then finally, you also get account data, which is um, user-specific settings, both per room and per account. So you can synchronize all of your preferences across all of your different clients, if you so desire. So how does it work? Um, let's look at this quickly. So this, can, is that coming up OK? Can you see it? Oh, that's not great. Um, blah, 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 blah. How can I fix that easily? Uh, let me do the universal thing, whatnot, whatever it's called. Invert colors. Sorry, one second. Uh, should be an accessibility. Really? Oh, is this 
changed... Oh, no, it'll be in here. Is that any better? <laughs> yeah, okay, perfect, brilliant. So, is that legible? Yeah, it's coming through, but great. So here we have three servers, Alice.com, Bob.com, and Charlie.com. Each one has a single user often. And say that uh, they're all participating in a room, so the room's got three people in it. Alice goes and sends a message like... Um, that and it's uh, we've even got and it's probably gone off the side of the page you can kind of see the curl um, command there it's a post with a json of a message of type m.txt and body saying hello goes through to a matrix uri and you get back uh, the event id that has been sent alice's server then persists that in there um, and signs it with the server and then pushes it out again via http to the other two servers for mesh and again, it's slightly cropped. You can see this on matrix.org homepage um, if you want to go through the specific um, JSON that's being passed around. But the cool thing is that this has been signed by the server to prove that it came from um, Alice, or Alice's server at least. This isn't showing end-to-end -end encryption. And it's also signing the message in the context of the data structure that it's building up, replicated over those servers. So these guys will go and persist it there too, and then they will push it out to the clients, at which point everybody's got Alice's message. Great. So what happens next? Say that Bob responds to. Now Bob's message here ends up um, being connected to the most recent message that he can see on that server in his room. So we're building up a graph data structure, or a tree, I guess, of the messages in that room. And the fun thing is that if Charlie races with Bob's message, which is quite likely, then we end up with a completely inconsistent data structure here. So Alice's view of the room is different to Bob's, is different to Charlie's, um, because it's an eventually consistent um, data structure that we're building up now. And it's not a problem, because all that will happen is that Bob's message will get pushed over to the other servers, at which point Alice and Bob's servers are in sync, but we split the data structure on Charlie's side because, um, well, both messages follow the first one and you know, who's to say which comes first? And likewise, when Charlie's message gets pushed out, again, it's gone, everybody is now um, consistent between the um, three um, servers. So everybody's got the same view of the room and if later on Alice sends another message, she will refer to both the second and third ones and kind of heal the race in the graph. So you're really building up this um, uh, CRDT data structure, technically, I guess, um, of um, uh, consistent messages across the servers. So that's really what's going on under the hood of Matrix. Let me flip this back and go back to here. So I always said that we've got about 30 different Matrix clients out there. And rather than keeping on talking, let me show you some of them. Um, so. Uh, text UIs, uh, well, first of all, probably Riot is the best one to look at. So Riot, Riot, Riot is the um, flagship client that we've uh, built. So there's a lot of overlap between the core Matrix team and the Riot development team in terms of showing off Matrix to be as good as possible. And it looks like this. So here's Riot. Um, here's Matrix HQ, which is our main um, room in, um, in Matrix that pretty much everybody joins right now. It's got 4,726 people in it. Is this visible okay? Can people see what's going on? Uh, hopefully. Yell if you go. Um, so what, what can we see here? We can see people chatting away. We've got typing notifications. We've got emoji in the usernames. We've got read receipts on the right-hand side doing this kind of Tetris-like drop-down. So as people say things... Um, I can say hello everybody, then um, people will start reading it and their messages will go dong, 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 dong as they read it, a bit like Facebook or Google Hangouts. I'm in about 600 different rooms here. Um, if I can hit the more button here, you can see it's everything here from Tolkien to Arch Linux to people talking about their old set, end to end, um, there's a hackathon happening, blah, 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 blah. You know, there's just, well, 393. Um, missed messages across a whole bunch of different rooms going on there. You've got URL previews as people go and mention um, uh, weird projects. We go and pull in like Slack to pull in more information. Uh, what else can I show you? Um, anyone? 
let's see if anybody wants to test video conferencing. This can, it can go horribly wrong. I'm asking a room of 5,000 people if they want to video conference with me. So anything can happen. Apologies if it's not safe for work or conferences. So I'm going to start off a video conference here. It is still beta, but hopefully it will work. Let's find out. Oh, hello. Come on, conferencing server. Oh, come on. Oh, there we go, possibly. Oh, so it sounds as if the network here might not be... Oh, exciting. The people joining. Oh, hello, Dave. Okay, so that's Dave who's had a, a, a hackathon. <laughs> Now, when I tested this earlier, the quality was working a little bit better, but it's not that bad. So, yeah, that's Dave, who's one of the lead developers on Matrix. He's at a hackathon at the moment in the depths of London somewhere. So, thanks for joining, Dave. We've got somebody else trying to join at the top. Oh, somebody from the audience. Really? This audience? Awesome. Very cool. Oh, in fact, I should. Uh, why don't I join him from my phone? That would be cool. Um, this can't possibly go wrong. <laughs> But yeah, it's a shame. The Wi-Fi it was working incredibly well when I was sitting there, but I'm wondering if I'm slightly out of the Wi-Fi range there. And so the iOS app on uh, Matrix works really well. It's a totally native app. It's no uh, web stuff. And I've got a pink bar telling me that there's a video conference. I go and hit the video conferencing there. Oh, interesting drop out there. Oh, and there I am here, hopefully. Hello, everybody. Come on. There we are. Beautiful thing of me on my phone there. There we go. Okay, so there's a demo. Oh. And you can see that everybody in the room will be seeing ongoing conference call um, at the top of the screen. Um, bridging would be a fun thing to show. So meanwhile, let's go to, let's go to a different room. Let's go to Matrix Dev here. Um, so this is uh, just for people hacking on top of um, Matrix in the community. Uh, I've got our obligatory XKCD talking about the 15th standard. Meanwhile, over in Slack, for instance, um, we've got Matrix Dev again. And, well, here's precisely the same stuff um, happening on Slack. And you can see um, that the same conversation is happening um, of people coming in from Matrix. I can wave back from Slack. And that will go through, um, hopefully, into uh, Matrix. There we go. So that's me. And if I hover over myself, it will have some horrible Slack user ID um, waving from Slack. Likewise, saying Gitter, then oh, you've got Matthew waving from Slack coming into Gitter. Uh, meanwhile, on IRC, uh, where's, oh, yep, yeah, there we go. I am waving from Slack. Hello from IRC. And so that will go back into IRC and come back there into Gitter and into Slack and into Matrix. So it really is gluing everything together. And um, in Riot, if you go into room settings here, um, you've got a manage integration button. This pulls up an iframe uh, with our um, sort of hosted bridges. All of this is open source, so you can run your own bridges. The integration thing um, is part of the admin API for that. And you can see this room is hooked into Gitter and Slack. We've got a GitHub integration. Uh, what other integrations do we have? Um, IRC bridging or Giphy, there's a Guggy GIF bot, RSS feed got added yesterday. Uh, we started integrations about a month ago, so we've only got like eight, but it's still kind of fun to keep adding them in. Anyway, that's probably... Uh, oh, and let me show you some other clients. So here is... Well, let me, f uh, let me find a command line client somewhere. Ah, too many windows. So I'm going to shell into my home machine and open up a screen session. And here it is, all over again, the same conversation happening, except this time it's um, happening in WeChat, if you've used WeChat. Um, so there's a great um, plugin for WeChat, uh, which uses Lua to act as a matrix client. And you can see the, you know, the experience isn't bad. And in fact, the performance for doing things like switching between rooms in this, between those 600 rooms is incredibly good. I can just hit F6 and we can go through every conversation I've ever had, modulate the Wi-Fi cracking up. So, oh, there we go. I'm still in the conference on my phone. I should probably hang up. <laughs> uh, what else can I show you? Um, desktop clients. Um, so the WeChat one was written by a Norwegian guy called Tor. Um, 
Here's a different one. This is called Nachat. This is written in Qt as a desktop client. Um, and um, it's really very fast, completely native code, all C++, using the Qt widgets. Um, you can see the hello from RC, hello from Slack conversation going on here. And switching between rooms. And let me go into uh, HQ. I'm not sure how this orders its rooms, but if I go into big HQ room, bing, and up it comes. Lots of ugly guest users there that we should get rid of. But you can see all 6,000 users, lots of guests um, hanging around that room, and people chatting about um, Telecom Bretagne in France, for whatever reason. Um, so uh, another client would be Caternion. So this is also Qt, except it's written with QML as the front-end um, UI. And you can see, well, it's the it's same view of the room with hello from IRC, hello from Getter. Oh, let me size it correctly. That's better. Um, quite a different UI with these tiles, and it's all done in QML, but it's really cool. So really fun to see people building proper clients as well as the web um, ones. Anyway, enough talking about Matrix itself. Let's talk about um, Python, probably. Um, so on the home server side, we've got Synapse, which is Python twisted, about 50,000 lines. We've had some performance and um, maintainability challenges um, with Twisted along the way. Um, there's Rumor, which is the Rust one I mentioned. There's also Dendron, which is a skeleton Golang that we've implemented, but honestly hasn't gone very far because we've spent all of our time working on Synapse instead. And there's also two other Go ones from the community, a Java one and a couple of others. Um, I've just showed you right already. So what about Python? So Synapse in more detail lives on GitHub. It, all of this is Apache licensed and um, open source, by the way, to be as permissive as possible. Um, it's the reference implementation, and it's your classic project that was very much a proof of concept of, hey, could this thing ever work? Which, here we are, two and a half years later, the proof of concept has just grown and um, gone into production with lots of people running these things. It's uh, about two and a half years old. Um, we wrote it in Python 2 and twisted, as I said at the beginning, um, basically because free Python 3.5 hadn't come out and because we perhaps misguidedly thought that um, twisted might be uh, mature, being basically the first asynchronous networking library out there, it invented an awful lot of the stuff that we use today in Node and AsyncIO. It's got about 550 classes, and it's pretty well tested with 114 unit tests, but a really interesting integration test harness, um, ironically written in Perl um, by the guy who wrote async IO on Perl, which is mysteriously similar to async IO on Python. And that actually has over 500 um, <laughs> integration tests, and it's designed to run against different <laughs> server implementations so that you can prove kind of conformance of your server to matrix spec. What does the synapse look like? Probably a quick way, in a bit of a silly way, I've never done this before, let's see what happens, um, is to try to just visualize it full stop like this. So this is um, a Gauss visualization. How do I make it go full screen? Ah, stop. Go full screen. God damn it. Oh, well. So basically, here we are. Um, ooh, ah. What have I done? Does anybody know how to drive this? Oh, there we go. That's better. Um, so here we are going and building Synapse um, back in the day. So the red stuff here is the REST, uh, is the API doc, the Sphinx doc. Um, then we've got Synapse itself here is Python. Let me go and try to make this more visible by naming it by directory. So yeah, we've got Synapse itself here. We've got database schemas here as SQL going and building up over time. We've got our original web client um, down here. And you've got... Um, uh, yeah, the other bits of it are basically the web client. So the interesting stuff to look at here is the main Python code base, um, which I'll show you the architecture of in a minute. And you can see that we're adding more and more deltas of SQL. And we're up to about 24 by this point, like this a year ago. Um, keeping on adding more functionality, adding in more handlers. Um, and we've got the storage layer here, which obviously the schema stuff hangs off. We've got um, the REST APIs, which form the endpoints um, for the um, application itself. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, general utilities, not very exciting. All configuration stuff. Um, what's that? That's the HTTP um, sort of handlers for the sort of core REST rather than the specific REST. 
uh, replication stuff for Federation, and here we are, caught up to the 12th of October, which is uh, right now, I guess, or yesterday, um, showing where we stand right now uh, with the Sphinx doc and the web client and everything else. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how big this thing is and how it grew over the last some two years. So, meanwhile, the architecture itself is really quite straightforward. You've got a database which stores all of this stuff and we support SQLite and Postgres. You have um, a storage layer on top of that, which we were just looking at in the viz. Um, in the center, you've got the main handlers, which are just handling events and rooms, federation for talking to other servers, presence typing, as you'd expect. On the left-hand side, we talk off to other home servers via all of the stuff in the federation um, class namespace. On the right-hand side, we talk to other clients by exposing REST endpoints, where you're literally, you know, to send a message in Matrix, you just say put or um, um, get, really, to send or receive a message. Um, so, performance. At first, it really sucked. I mean, we deliberately did it as a very basic um, prototype to test the whole thing, um, expecting to throw it away, but we never did. The database schema was very naive, um, only supporting SQLite. There wasn't any in-memory caching, so whenever you wanted to do anything, you started talking SQL. Um, just looking vaguely at profiling on it, there was a lot of time spent doing JSON marshalling. Um, awful lot of CPU spent federating. It turned out that we were wasting a lot of time doing push notifications um, in that if I send a single message into a room with 5,000 people, naively, you end up executing the push notification rules, which can be quite complicated um, like, well, for every single user. And even calculating badge counts can be surprisingly bad because you need to track back to the read position of everybody in that room and constantly resum it up. Basically, there's a lot of room for caching on it. Um, we're also limited by running on a single process thanks to the global interpreter lock. We are using some threading for asynchronous um, database access, but the core Python stuff is all limited by the Go, even though the code is all asynchronous via twisted equivalent of async IO. And yeah, the, we're talking like three messages a second in a big room, which is shows. So since um, probably mid-2015, we've done a lot of optimization. So first of all, we added Postgres, which sped things up by about five. Um, added lots and lots and lots of in-memory caches. And in fact, we went too far because everybody started complaining that Synapse used too much RAM because it would literally suck everything into memory. Um, we then use string interning to shrink them back down again because it's all JSON objects. There's a huge amount of duplication over the keys of these JSON things. Um, we um, denormalized the database schema in order to uh, speed up the queries. So we deliberately started replicating data around so we didn't have to keep joining it. But then we had to remove redundancy of the denormalized stuff. Because, for instance, every time there was a state change, we were storing a complete snapshot of the state of the room. So in Matrix HQ, somebody joins the room, suddenly you have to persist 6,000 JSON objects to disk. Stupid. Should be done as deltas. So we changed it a few months ago to expressing it as deltas, which um, improved the database usage by a factor of 10. Um, switched to uJSON rather than whatever the generic JSON thing we were doing before, which helps an awful lot for native JSON. Did all the optimizations for push rule calculations. Really interestingly, we split things out horizontally. So we took endpoints and moved them from the core synapse process to be running alongside it um, for, to allow it to horizontally scale. We played a bit with PyPy, but it didn't seem to be buying as much. Honestly, we haven't looked into it that much more. So if there are any PyPy experts, please try running synapse under PyPy and tell us why it doesn't go much faster. Obviously, it uses like four times more RAM, but we expect that for PyPy. And nowadays, it's at least 30 messages a second across um, a sensible server, which isn't amazing. And obviously, relative to XMPP, it's terrible. But as I said at the beginning, it's doing very, very different things here. It's still using quite a lot of RAM. My personal server uses about 1.3 gigabytes idle, which again is big, but there is still a lot of room for optimization left here. The horizontal scaling stuff is worth talking about a little bit more. So previously, we just had a single monolithic synapse um, object, um, sorry, process. Nowadays, matrix.org is running off about 10 different processes. 
because we split out um, Synchrotron, which is when you are syncing data onto your client into a separate process tree of workers. We've got general client and support. We've got app service, media repository, push notifications, and federation all split out as separate processes. And the architecture is kind of like database replication. Each of these workers goes and subscribes to a stream emitted by the main Synapse process and then offloads stuff. And critically, they all cluster horizontally. So whenever we start hitting CPU limits on a single process, we just fire up another process, have it um, replicating um, through, and um, we would be dead otherwise because matrix.org server is obviously the first one everybody uses and it's very, very popular. And um, yeah, we would have completely run out of CPU if we hadn't done that long ago. So Python interested, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Well, the good is that it did do what we wanted it to do. We wanted to rapidly prototype the whole matrix idea with async <laughs> idioms. Um, and we didn't want to get lost in callback hell, so we used um, inline deferreds um, uh, everywhere and yields, and it did uh, the right thing for us. Nowadays, we would use async IO probably. Um, other good Python things is that we, uh, packaging now works really well, despite the fact we have all the dependencies, especially um, things like the Python image library and Pi NACL for all of our crypt. So we had a nightmare with Pi NACL um, and had to do a lot of work on its packaging to make it install reliably. But nowadays, it's actually working fine. And things which people say is, oh, cool, I can just install this with pip and it works. I was amazed. I'm amazed too, but we got there eventually. Um, just talking from my own perspective, I had a lot of fun hunting some memory leaks using the twisted manhole, which is allowing you to SSH into the twisted server and just start directly poking the um, process and querying it and running things like um, Objgraph to look for memory leaks and we found some interesting uh, memory problems through that. The bad thing by far is that in Twisted, and I'm not sure how Async IO does it, but in Twisted it is incredibly easy to forget to put an explicit yield or to forget to mark your um, function as being defer inline callbacks. And it fails in all sorts of exotic and very subtle ways uh, because you know, it's the only way to tell whether it should be executed as synchronous or asynchronous. So you write your whole thing forget to put the critical yields in the critical place, and it falls back to behaving synchronously, and eventually you finally work out what's going wrong, especially for new people. And I should have introduced myself. I'm the tech lead on Matrix, um, but I work more on the client side rather than the Python side. Occasionally, I go into Synapse and try to do something, and the first thing I always do is to forget a yield, and the whole thing explodes. Um, stat traces were very hard to find, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Profilers were a disaster, and this was one of our single biggest problems, because the stack is shredded as you keep um, asynchronously switching between all the different concurrent things going on, your conventional C profiler is screwed. It cannot give you a sensible stack trace as to what's going on. And when we started to hit our CPU limits at first, it, you know, there was a real, oh my god, we've painted ourselves into a corner here where we don't know what's happening. Where is our CPU going? We also got bitten by IPv6 because we built everything using Twisted's agent library, uh, which turns out still not to have IPv6 support, which is very frustrating. And honestly, towards the end, we were really starting to miss static typing because um, our background certainly was doing lots of C++ VoIP stacks and lots of Java web apps. And whilst the flexibility and speed of Python's typing was great for getting up and running, we kind of hit a very well-defined level at about 20, 30,000 lines of code where we were starting to get really bizarre, embarrassing bugs where people had failed um, on the typing safety side of things. So the ugly, well, we managed to get stat traces working, but um, it's one of the most horrific hacks I've ever seen where we deliberately break the twisted reactor, which goes and actually executes the asynchronous stuff to go and defer the deferreds so that they all execute at the same time, um, at the same tick, which basically exploits a race condition in how the implementation of this works, such that there is more of a chance that you can get a coherent stat trace from the library. It works, but it's one of those, oh, we shouldn't have to have done that in order to be able to just see a stat trace of what is going on. Um, the profiling um, side of things was a bit more interesting and isn't quite so ugly. 
In the end, what we've done is to define a custom logging context, which you can invoke with with, with the with statement, as well as these wrapper functions. And that explicitly uses our usage to look at the CPU stats and measure the amount of user and kernel CPU that is going into a particular um, method. So basically, all of our log lines at the end of it have the option of telling you how much CPU went into that particular method. But the problem is, that you have to manually apply this to every single async operation. So not only are you having to not screw up and remember when to put yields and deferred inline callbacks everywhere, we also now have to remember to always go and put a preserve context over function or a preserve context over deferreds and use the right dialects. And it's, um, yeah, uh, basically, uh, we still have gaps in the code base where there is some deferred stuff happening, possibly not in our own code, which we have no visibility on because it hasn't been annotated correctly. So putting those manual annotations has been a real pain. If anybody knows how to correctly profile Twisted or has written a Twisted Aware profiler, we would love to talk to you because turning our whole application into a self-profiling thing doesn't seem to be the best way to do it necessarily. So would we do it again? Well, Synapse itself is here to stay. Loads of people are using it. Um, it's not going away anytime soon. Um, Twisted served as well. Obviously, we'd be looking at Python 3.5 and Sync IO if we were doing it now. Um, we also would want to look at MyPy and other gradual typing approaches, which I think could help us a lot, but we haven't had a chance. And finally, it's really, I mean, in the end, Matrix isn't language specific. We've got people building it in all sorts of different languages, and it's fun to see which ones work better from the community. Quickly, the API itself looks like this. If you want to post a message, you go and put some JSON to URL, you get back an ID. More interestingly, if you want to set up a WebRTC call, you likewise send some JSON and you put it to a URL and you get back the event ID. So if you wanted to set up a WebRTC call, it's really like four messages here. One to invite the person you're talking to, another to send them the candidates to the media you want to send them. They answer with an answer and then somebody hangs up and that's it. So relative to SIP, personally, I think this is a good thing. Um, bridges kind of look like this, with the bridge connecting together the servers and the apps. Um, the stack is Node that we use for that by default, but people have also written Python ones. And in fact, there is an async I.O. based um, bridge to Gitter that has been written by somebody in Pure 3.5, which looked really cool. But the one that we ship from matrix.org is, um, uh, is the Node one here. And we've got loads of them. We've got IRC, Slack, SMS. We hook into libpurple. It's only a proof of concept, but if anybody likes libpurple, we would love for some help in going and um, making the bridge work um, to uh, go and connect through to everything that libpurple can speak. Um, although it is Node, so <laughs> it might not be in the right audience. Um, we've done IoT, hooked it up to a Parrot drone, lots and lots of fun um, to get the video stream off the drone into all of Matrix and then get the telemetry off the drone as well as control the drone by the command line interface. This was a great demo until I crashed the drone into conference into Ward Cunningham, who invented the wiki. Sorry, Ward. Um, we connect through to FreeSwitch. FreeSwitch was what was doing the conferencing earlier. Um, and finally, community status. Yeah, we started out in September two years ago. Uh, we actually started writing the code in May. Um, we're currently very late beta, um, going out of beta kind of gradually. So Wyatt as an app is out of beta, but Synapse is still in beta. We've got about 400,000 accounts on the matrix.org server. Um, we're pushing around 400,000 messages a day. We've got 50,000 rooms on that server. And more interestingly, from that server, we can see 1,000 other um, servers which people are running. So it's not quite as big as email or the web or even XMPP. But um, if you look at the graphs, it's kind of fun. So this is unbridged users on matrix.org. The 400,000 includes people who are coming in from IRC and Slack and Gitter and so aren't explicitly participating in Matrix. But people who are, who've actually signed up and are using it, um, we're up at about 90,000 right now. You can see uh, the, there's a little glitch for um, FOSDEM um, here and another one for FOSDEM there. Then we launched um, Riot as beta, then we launched Riot as production, and you can sort of see how things are accelerating. However, that's um, total registration, so it's not showing active use. Um, so um, uh, in terms of um, timing, and I'm on my final slide, 
Um, the, this is more what active use is looking like. This is non-bridged messages through the system. At the beginning, it's kind of zero messages a day, strangely enough. But you can see that things are really, really, really starting to accelerate, especially after the Riot launched properly. And we got on the front page of TechCrunch and stuff like that. And people have been using it lots and lots. So lots of stuff coming up. We need help, if it wasn't obvious. Uh, we need help really on IPv6 and Twisted. Some people have offered to um, finish uh, or he help us make it work. Um, but we also need people to just run servers and have a play with it, give us feedback on the APIs, follow us on Twitter. Um, consider if you're building a new app not to invent a custom messaging protocol. Please use Matrix, please use XMPP, anything other than making your own thing. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Yeah, do we have any time for any questions? Sorry for running a bit late. We have a question. Hello, thanks a lot for the presentation. Yeah, thank yes, you. Nowadays we are around uh, 7.4 billion connected objects uh, worldwide. And I'm, I'm seeing that uh, in your use case that is IoT. Mm -hmm. I just have a question. In, 20, in 2020, we are talking about uh, how I say, 50 billion connected objects. Are you mm -hmm. ready for this challenge? Oh yeah, I hope so. <laughs> um, so on the IoT side of things, basically there's been a lot of standardization about what happens in a home or in a kind of local area network. And I'm sure people are familiar with IoTivity or the All Scene Alliance. There hasn't been much work on the bigger picture of actually gluing things together over the internet and having this kind of open um, interoperability layer. Now, in terms of uh, 50 billion devices or whatever it is by 2020, obviously, right now, um, Synapse isn't going to be scaling up to that. But by 2020, we would expect there to be many different um, implementations. And hopefully, we'll have done a lot more optimization on Synapse itself. And something quite interesting I didn't mention at all is the idea of going and running servers on the clients. So we're hoping that in, in the kind of next year or so to start experimenting with shifting the servers entirely onto clients, at which point it scales a lot more interestingly and becomes a pure peer-to-peer -peer network. So yeah, we obviously want to do that. <laughs> oh, up there. Ce sera la dernière parce que il faut qu'on mange. Hey, uh, I'm just curious, I don't know if you told about this, but um, about the decision to use Twisted, like even two years ago. Because I've used Twisted, but like many, many years ago, and it was already like, ah, oh, yeah, all this shit with defaults and with the callbacks, and it's very, very hard to use, I, I found. And uh, mm -hmm. I feel like even two years ago, there, there were already like other mature uh, Python frameworks to, to deal with. Yep, I mean, there was Tulip at that point, which is what eventually turned into Async IO, I think. Honestly, yeah, we have a love-hate relationship with it. And in the end, the decision to go with Twisted was basically me trying to resolve an argument because pretty much everybody on the team had a slightly different preference of language and environment. And all of our previous stuff had been quite enterprisey. As I said, it was horrible Java um, servlet stuff, or it was hardcore C++ that is fine if you happen to be a C++ wizard, but everybody else hates. So we wanted something that um, was appealing to an open source audience that people would be happy running. and. We wanted something that was mature, and people had, had a lot of experience making work well. And I'd done some Twisted in the past, and a few other people had. Nobody had really written Python professionally before, however. And in retrospect, it might not have been the best um, choice to make. But in the end, we just wanted to get home and write some code. We picked with it, seemed to be working, stuck with it had some problems, and once you get used to the deferred and the yield model that you have there, other than the fact you keep forgetting the bloody things, um, it's not been that bad. But yeah, it's, it is what it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Bon appétit.